Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. Today is a very, very big day in the NBA calendar. The beginning of free agency officially opens tonight, 6 p.m. Eastern, and we got trade news, rumors, we got a lot to cover. This is like Christmas in the NBA calendar, aside from actual Christmas Day in the NBA calendar. Thanks. Um, so, because a lot of teams are about to get shaken up, I'm gonna get some gifts and some star players. So, um, you know, we're gonna have a lot, a lot to cover. This is gonna be like our, our full free agency preview show. We're all going through the biggest uh, unrestricted free agents, restricted free agents, sign and trade opportunities. We're gonna go ahead and get into all of that on today's episode. But before we get into all that, how are we doing today, Dane? I'm doing great, man. It's always a good day. You know, I'm repping my Lakers gear. You know what I'm saying? Got to represent my team. Especially because, you know, we got we to get at least one or two of these guys today, man. I, I We got to come home with at least one or two of these guys. So, I'm excited. I'm, I'm ready to see where a lot of people go. Yeah, and for, for those of you listening on audio platforms, we're in, one of the biggest free agents ever <laughs> had to get it on for free agents. They got the <laughs> Cleveland throwback Reebok LeBron jersey on. Um, you know, Wearing that, right? Because he did the decision live on ESPN. And he, the big reason why free agency is as big as it is now, right. started the whole player empowerment movement. So, got to make sure I'm representing properly for free agency. But, gonna go ahead and get the housekeeping out of the way. If you are on YouTube, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Go ahead and drop a comment if you like the new overlay we got going on here. We got some new software, we got new webcams, new mics. We're leveling up. We're leveling right, up right. here on the Off the Glass podcast. So we appreciate the support there. If you are listening on audio platforms, go ahead and leave a five star review on the pod um, and pre download the show as well. It helps us out a ton. Um, and go ahead and subscribe to the socials that you see at, on the bottom of the screen. Uh, it's Instagram at Off the Glass Pod and then TikTok at Off the Glass Podcast. We're posting shorts content daily. We're almost at 100 followers on the Instagram, so go ahead and follow the pages. Um, We appreciate all the support. And without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get right into it. We were going to start with free agency news and just dive right in, but the NBA never can go too long without big drama, big news. And it came out last, it was like afternoon, almost evening that James Harden is opting into his contract in Philadelphia and requesting a trade out of Philadelphia. So very, very short-lived duo between Harden and Embiid. Again, no conference finals appearances. A lot of chokes. Right. (laughs) (laughs) um, James Harden is going to be on, this is his fourth team in four years, right? Houston, Brooklyn, Brooklyn, Philly. Philly. Yeah. Yeah. This is fourth team in four seasons. From a good player too. It's like it's not like he's some journeyman. Like he's a he was performing really, really well. Even this year, he led the league in assists. So it's not mm-hmm. like he had like a crazy bad year. And I know in the playoffs, like it was kind of bad the way it went out, but he still had two forty point games. He had he had stole the game one, to even put them in a better position to win the series, so the market for James Harden should be pretty high, but it is kind of crazy how in four years from a former MVP, you're on your fourth different team. Yeah, it uh, it's weird to see. I think someone put out a graphic where I think he's now is the current leader in the since the, since the 2000s in trade requests. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's keep it track of that. I don't know. It was it was kind of a joke list, but it was like he requested out of Houston, he requested out of Brooklyn, and now he's requesting out of Philly. So three trade requests in about four seasons' time. Um, so the 76ers are going to have a, a very interesting offseason, even more so than we, we thought they were going to. Um, the first and biggest, biggest rumor that's been going on ever since the news broke is that the Clippers are expected to be a top team of interest in looking to land James Harden, as well as the New York Knicks. What do you think about either of those two teams landing a guy like James Harden? I think I love the Clippers fit. 
Um, I'm trying to put my Lakers bias aside, you know how that go. But if I'm just obviously looking at it from a basketball standpoint, I like the Clippers fit because they need a point guard. They need someone who can set up Paul George, Kawhi, just run the offense a little bit better than, honestly, any point guard they've had in the past, I don't know, what, four years? Ever since Kawhi and Paul George has been there, it seems like they never had a real point guard. A lot of their guards have been, like, score first, pass second type guards. So James Harden going there, you know he can play along other superstars. You know he can obviously run your offense. He led the league in assists last year. He can set up the guys, like I said, the, your shooters around your shooters around them, Kawhi Leonard, Paul George. So fit-wise, I think, yeah, I think it's a great fit. The problem, again, it's still going to be health because, you know, Kawhi is never healthy. Paul George is never mm-hmm. healthy. So that's still going to be the problem. But if we're just talking about a basketball standpoint and you're not trying to break it down and break up the Kawhi, the Kawhi Paul George, like little tandem they got going on, add in James Harden. That that could be real, real scary for everyone in the West. So we always say if they stay healthy, but if they get James Harden and they stay healthy, legitimately are a top contender in the West. But so the the Knicks, uh, I'll, I'll let you talk about the Clippers first. The Knicks, I got, I don't know how I feel about that one yet. Yeah, I, I said even this year, like my dark horse to win the West, again, if they could stay healthy was the Clippers. The team always had, they had the depth. It always was just... Can we get Kawhi and PG? We can't do one of them. And it ended up you can't even get either of them in the playoffs for Mm -hmm. more than game one. Um, So health, like you said, is always going to be the issue there. But the team as it was this year, I thought, was constructed to be a legitimate title contender. And if they can add James Harden to that, obviously they have to offload a lot of contracts. I think they would have to get off of um, Terrence Terrence Mann, Robert Covington, Um, I think Batum's contract as well, all to just make the money fit to be able to get Harden in. Mm -hmm. Um, So obviously you lose a bit of depth there, but um, again, with that much talent, you're going to be able to pull in one or two vets because people are going to see this is a ring chasing opportunity the same way that um, teams look to do that in the past with the Nets or the Warriors a few years ago. So um, I'm not too concerned in that front because again, when you stack the deck that heavily, you're going to be able to try to pull in some some veteran talent there. So um, I think the Clippers is a really interesting fit. I think Sixers fans are not going to be too happy if that trade goes through because, to your point, I don't think we would see Paul George being moved in that deal. I think the Clippers mm-hmm. would try to do everything they can to form a big three around those two. Um, because in my head, I think this raises – legitimate questions on if Joel Embiid is going to stay in Philly. And not to say that they've done wrong by him. He's always had a competitive roster ever since they really jumped and made that leap. Mm -hmm. When it was, you know, you had had the, the fully grown process 76ers with him and Ben. You add in Jimmy, you have JJ on that team. It was a really good team. Right. You lose Jimmy, you get Tobias, right? <laughs> you bring in James Harden and you ship out Ben Simmons. Like they always are constantly cycling through guys. Nothing is just working. And a lot of that can be attributed to the on court shortcomings of their stars that were on the team in the playoffs. And so I don't put as much blame on the front office. To me, I thought getting James Harden in the first place was not the best option for them at the time. But again, that goes back to how we both view building teams is why do we always go so hard on star, ta- star power, star talent when you could have flipped somebody like you know Ben Simmons, kept guys like Seth Curry, um, and maybe gotten more complimentary pieces around Joel Embiid. And you have a really built out roster that way. Again, it's tough to win this league with just one star, but when you do have the MVP, like some people can rise to the occasion. You already got Tobias Harris on the roster. According to his dad, I'll make him just sit in the corner anyway. Mm -hmm, So mm -hmm. he would be a little bit more open in that offense. And I would just like to see them go that route instead of always trying to make the big name splash player. But um, look, they did. We see where that resulted them and... Here they are about to, to move James Harden off. So, um, yeah, that's that's how I feel about the fit with the Clippers. But pivoting over to the Knicks side of things, I understand why, right? Like, 
They missed out on Donovan Mitchell. They hit the one of the biggest home runs, probably the best signing in free agency last year in the Jalen Brunson contract. Right, you bring in Josh Hart. Um, fit is great. Mitchell Robinson's had a great last year. Julius Randle, whatever you think of him in the, the playoffs or him as a player in general, all-NBA, all-star player this past year. You bring in James Harden, that is a very, very, very good core unit. Top three core in the East easily. Mm-hmm. Easily. Maybe top two. Like you, There's arguments to be made about between them, <clears throat> the Celtics, and the Bucks. They, they, they then live in that conversation if they're able to land a guy like James Harden. All right. But at the same time, what does their offense look like bringing James Harden in? What is that then? Granted, we do know what Jalen Brunson can do as a secondary ball handler or even just playing with another ball handler because he, the reason he even got the bag in, in New York is because of how well he played in the playoffs with Luka. So I'm not as concerned there. Again, it just goes to what would you have to give up in this deal to get James Harden? How does your team then look? How much of your depth do you have to give up to bring in a, a top guy in talent? Um, again, to make the money match, you're going to have to move some larger contracts. Does R.J. Barrett stay? Does Obi Toppin stay? Can you keep a guy like Emmanuel quickly? Some of that has to do with what the 76ers are going to look to do because – you know, if you're going and bringing in some of the young talent that the, the Knicks have and guys like Quinn Grimes and IQ, even guys like, you know, Miles McBride, whatever, um, how does that fit Joel Embiid's timeline? Right. This could All of this could launch a crazy domino effect, not just in the East, but in the NBA as a whole with massive shakeup. So I think the fit on the, the Clippers is a little bit better just because of, A, the the higher star power that they do have with Kawhi and PG, the continuity that they all have, um, and then bringing James Harden into that, um, they still would have a good amount of depth on their roster, even if they do trade off of guys like Covington and Batum, and I'm confident that they can sign vets. The New York fit, I don't know. I just like what they have going with who they have right now a lot. Exactly. That I feel like bringing Harden in might – mess that rhythm in the offense up that they had. Um, but again, at the end of the day, I think that if you paired Julius Randle, Jalen Brunson, and James Harden together, we are at least in the conversation with what the Celtics have with Tatum Brown, Porzingis, and what the Bucks have and Giannis, Drew, and potentially Chris Middleton, who we'll get to later in the in the episode. But But what do you think about the Knicks fit with Harden? I'm curious to see how they would fit on the court just because – I don't know, it's tough because in my head, James Harden just seems like a point guard now. We forget that James Harden actually, like, majority of his career was a shooting guard. Because um, he's, play, he's played point guard for, it seems like, the past, what, four years, basically. But um, when we seen him in that shooting guard role, it's it was mainly just ISO. My, I got the ball, uh, high usage player, and I'm just going one-on-one. So I'm curious to see how it would work, him playing alongside Jalen Brunson. Um Talent wise, yeah, they would be a good team. Again, I would have to see what they would give up in order to get James Harden. But yeah, they would be a good team. The only thing that concerns me is like, I'm be honest, like in the regular season, I think they would be one of the top teams. But come postseason, we have two guys on the team who I don't really trust in the playoffs. I don't trust Julius Randle in the playoffs at all. Mm-hmm. And at this point, how can you trust James Harden in the playoffs? As, as great of regular season that he's had, we've seen time and time again that when it comes postseason, is he's not that same player. So, um. That I think I think it'd be interesting. Like I said, talent wise, it would be good. James Harden, I think he can adapt and play another way. Like obviously, he changed his whole game and transitioned to point guard, so he can play multiple different ways. I'll be interested to see how it works. But the playoffs really does concern me as far as them stepping up right there. But like I said, the Clippers fit I think is probably best case scenario. But I have another team in there that I've seen a little bit. How do you feel like the? How do you feel about the Miami Heat? I was literally, as you're saying that, looking at somebody's mock trade um, to get hard into Miami. That is a fit, to be honest with you, that I think is better than either of the two that we just talked about. Because to me, it fits that it fits what we've been saying the Heat are missing, right? Because mm-hmm. then it automatically moves Jimmy back to secondary scoring option. Right. They have a, a guy who can be the primary ball handler, and that's not going to really disrupt too much of their offense. 
a, a James Harden Bam pick and roll elevated, right? That is mm-hmm. going to be we you know what how he operates in the pick and roll. I think that that would be great for for everybody involved. Does Harden fit Heat culture? I, I don't know. He fit Miami, I'll tell you that much. He, be <laughs> he a, definitely he fit, Miami. fit Miami. He fit Miami. But what do the what do the Heat give up in this? Like all of this to me feels like it goes back to well, okay, if I'm the 76ers, right, and I'm about to trade my second star, am I not gonna I'm not getting a star back? So then, okay, if I'm going, you know, young depth players. Why would Joel and B want to stay here? So you mm. they need to tread very, very careful carefully because and obviously all of this is just rumors and speculation, but if you're Joel and B, right, and granted this is a bleacher report mock trade, so these are not always the greatest, but I'm looking at one here that has their first round pick this year in Jaime Jaquez, Kyle Lowry, a first round swap and two other first-round picks for Harden. If I am Joel Embiid, and that is the type of return we just got for Harden, I'm straight. Like, <laughs> for real, like, what are we doing here? Like, right. that is not a contending team in the East. Just yeah. that's the reality of it. So, if you're going to move Harden, and you're not going to get a guy like Bam back because the Heat wouldn't let him go, you're definitely not going to get Jimmy back in Philly. So, where does that put your franchise? Like, you, are you really going to hit the hard reset and go back to tanking after you just tanked the in, almost the entirety of the 2010s? Right. <laughs> nah, like, I think, how, you feel, how you feel about this? So, I've seen this talked about before. They trade James Harden. Say they trade with the Clippers and whoever. They just get assets back. Not players mm-hmm. you're confident that will help you contend this year. But just assets, maybe some picks, things like that. And then they they can then enter like the Damian Lewis sweepstakes. They could try to see if Dame, if he really wants to ask out, that could be an opportunity that he can go or a place that he can go. If that doesn't work out, listen, I'm not a huge fan of paying Kyrie Irving a lot of money. But that's also an option. It only if you are afraid of Joel Embiid asking out and like wanting a trade, whether yeah. it's this year or next offseason. So I feel like it would be a panic move. I'm admit that it, it definitely would be a panic move. But at least it can help assure your superstar and Joel Embiid. Like, all right, we're still trying to win. We're still trying to contend. We got you. We lost a, a, your second star, but we got you another one. Like that could be on the table. So. I don't know how you feel about that, but that's just an option because they're definitely on the hot seat as far as, like, superstar trade request watch. If this trade goes badly and Joel Embiid gets frustrated, he could definitely be asking out of Philly. Yeah, and that's a, like, that's very ballsy of the Sixers if they were to go down that route because, again, now then you would be banking on somebody like Dame to actually want to get traded. Because yeah. the more I've thought about it, when I really view that situation, it comes off as we're the trailblazers, right? Damian Lillard's been our guy for, what is it, 10, 12 years now. I think he's the best trailblazer ever, right? Mm-hmm. You people still make debates between him and Clyde. He's the franchise all-time leading scorer. He's better multiple, than Clyde. multiple series winning game shots. Like so many iconic moments in Portland. Scored 71 points this past year. Like... He, he is Portland, right? I think he's the greatest trailblazer ever. They don't want to trade that. At the same time, Damian Lillard being as loyal as he is, I don't think he wants to put them in a situation where he's going to go and request the trade. So we're living in this, like, will they, won't they, kind of like weird tension. But neither one of them feels like they want to do wrong by the other person. And so the end result is, here goes, like, we know he kind of wants to leave. He wants to, he wants to be in a contender, but we didn't trade the three pick. We got Scoop. We got this great young core, but right. we don't want to trade Dame. He doesn't want to ask for a trade. It's just like this constant cycle, right, back and forth. So to me, if you're, if you're the 76ers and that's what you're going to bank on, I don't know because if it doesn't happen, right, you just got young assets and then, like, you're going to have to blow. I can't imagine B1 to stay much longer. Honestly, though, I think 
I, I, I definitely hear what you're saying. I think both sides of Portland, I think they actually do want to trade. Like, I think both of them. I think they know that's the right move. I just right. think neither one of them want to make that initial, like, I don't think we're ever going to hear Damian Lillard request a trade. I no. think the trade the trade is just going to happen if it ever does or it just doesn't. It's Bro, gonna, like, there's never going to be no official Damian Lillard is requesting a trade. It's not going to happen. Right. Bro, they're in like a marriage. They're both unhappy, but neither of them want to file for <laughs> right. divorce. Like, they want to do it, but they don't want to be the one. Like, if the other person said that, they're like, oh, okay. Like, they'll be glad if the other person wants, like, request a trade or Portland, like, says, okay, we're trading you. So, I see. I definitely see what you're saying, though, but just because with this whole situation, they've been talking about this for years. So, like, banking on that, yes, it's just, it would be a little bit tough. But at this point, I mean... I don't really know what your other options are if you trade if you trade hard because like you said you're not getting a star back you're probably gonna get young players maybe some assets it's like where do you really go from here so um yeah it's it's gonna be real real interesting um like I said Philly Philly's on the hot seat with their superstar right now yeah they have uh I would not want to be Daryl Morey you are in a very very tough position right now and need to tread very very carefully right. uh, because. Not just for, you know, your own sake and trying to keep the reigning MVP of the league happy, but Philly fans are ruthless. And I could you imagine if they had to go into a full on reset again after what they did from like 2010, 2011, all the way to like 2016? You can't put them through that again, bro. You can't openly tank, openly be the worst team in basketball for years. Admitting that you're trying to lose, because oh yeah, later down the line we're gonna get it. It's gonna be all worth it when we're a dynasty, when we're winning championships, and don't even make it to the Eastern Conference Finals. Come on, and then you go, and then you trade your second star, then you trade this superstar who is basically the face of the process, like he is the prize to this whole thing. Just one MVP, then he asks out, and then you go back into a rebuild. You like. You just can't do that, man. Like you, can't, you can't do that. You gotta do something. I don't know what you're gonna do, but you gotta do something. Going back to the Kyrie thing, though, it feels like teams are just recycling through the same couple of like marquee guards every single offseason. At this point, James Harden is up, Kyrie is up, Westbrook is up. Right. It's like we're just all, like teams are just like. This one didn't work. Let me see if I can try this right, one out. Let's like, swap this guy, yeah. Right? <laughs> Just like this constant, constant cycle. Um, but yeah, bring it. Speaking of, speaking of Kyrie, let's really get into the free agency preview. He, now that Harden has opted into his contract and is technically no longer free agent, but is going to be moved, um, Kyrie is now the biggest high profile, unrestricted free agent on the market. And. Again, if it's money that Kyrie is looking for, he can stay in Dallas and get a five-year, $272 million fully guaranteed contract. Again, I don't think that Dallas really wants to offer them that, him that much. I can imagine there's a world where they basically counter-offer that with maybe a three-year max deal, maybe a four-year deal with some particular stipulations in it um but again you run the risk like mark cuban has already been vocal about how he feels like they mishandled the brunson situation last season i don't know do you want to go down that route and trying to maybe not low ball but not give Kyrie the full deal and then if he walks you lose him for nothing so you traded a lot to get him yeah so like again same same type of situation that, that Philly might be in. You end up losing your star, your, your second star, right? What, what does Luka want to do? Like, does Luka end yeah. up wanting to stay in Dallas long term? Like, not to say that we always want this constant shakeups. Like, it's great to have a guy stick it out with an organization for a long time. When you see them get over that hump, it means that much more to their fans, to their city, to his legacy. Like, mm-hmm. But at the same time, like these are things you have to be aware of because, I mean, he's playing like a top, one of the top players in the league. Like, are we going to waste these years because we can't put an adequate wa- a roster around him? Right. So, it's been reported that that Kyrie may meet with the Suns. 
that. Get out of here, bro. Like, what are we talking about? David Stern, bro, where are you at when we need you, bro? Yeah. <laughs> like, what are we talking about? What is he meeting with them for? Is he going to take the vet minimum? Like, it's literally impossible for him. Look, to if it's not about money to him. If it's not know. about money, he need to come to the Lakers. Not even as a Lakers fan. Just genuinely, if it's really not about money, I'd rather, if I was him, I'd rather go to the Lakers. There would be a, a better constructed roster than the Suns. They would have, Suns would have more talent, obviously. Way more talent. But if you, if it's really not about money at all, why not come to a place where you have defenders around you, a good defense? I mean, we ain't shooting that good, but you're one of the shooters <laughs> on the team. And you'll be a key part of it, like, why would you want to go there to the Suns on a vet minimum when they got three other stars? Like, bro, you know. I think Kyrie, like Kyrie on the Suns. Like, I don't even. How does that even function? Kyrie, yeah, they beat like, what is your team? Is KD playing the five? Like <laughs> Kyrie, yeah. D book, Bill, like KD. KD, like bro, and Aiton. I guess so he's playing the four. Like. That's so disgusting. I mean, that's it's a, cra- that's a cra- it's crazy. Oh my god! <laughs> it's crazy. Somebody, somebody, I saw somebody tweet. They're like, if Kyrie goes to the Suns, that'll be the most here break him down offense you've ever it, seen in your life. Just be straight <laughs> isos, and everybody's getting cooked. <laughs> bro, that's what I said. Bro, it's mis. I, offensively, it's mismatches across the board. Yeah. Like somebody on your team is gonna get cooked <laughs> by one of these buckets we have over here. Yeah. So offensively, yeah, it'd be an all star team. It'd be crazy. And honestly, those are that that would be one of the super teams that I think if it was to happen, first of all, they need to be invested. If if that if that <laughs> happens, if he goes there for the minimum, nah bro. Somebody has to investigate that. But if that does happen, that's one of the teams where I'm not gonna be like, oh, but they don't have no depth. It's like, bro, they have Kyrie. I don't, Beal. Right. Like at that point, it doesn't you, matter. You, bro. You're reaching like that <laughs> Golden stars. State Warriors KD yeah. level where it was like, bro, it. I don't care what t- you give me the greatest team in NBA history. I'm taking the Warriors. Like it's right. too much top end talent at once. Right. So <clears throat> I don't know how how feasible that is. Obviously, their money is extremely tied up, so he'd have to take a huge pay cut. But again. If he's not in it for the money, there's a lot of other teams that could be very interesting fits on the table. 100%. So, Kyrie is going to be one of the biggest dominoes here um, in this uh, in this free agency period. He so, has no market, though, I heard. Like, n- like barely any market just because of all like, the off-the-court stuff and the injury concerns and just him being unreliable. Like, mm-hmm. I, like besides... This what Dallas, the Lakers are the were the most desperate team, the one that won them the most a while ago, and now it just seems like we're just gonna run it back. So mm-hmm. I can't see a place unless Philly gets desperate, like we said with the James Harden trade. I can't really see a place that's gonna pay him the money he wants and still be a contender. But even even the teams that have the money to pay him, the young teams, why would you bring Kyrie Irving in when you have most of the young teams that have money? have young players who they want to see develop. Kyrie is not going to – he's just going to stunt their growth. So it's like right. there's not a lot of teams in the NBA that makes sense for Kyrie Irving to go to. Yeah, I, and I think the only way he goes to any of these other contending teams would have to be through like kind of a sign-and-trade type of deal. Yeah. Um, that's the only way he could get any type of decent money, really. Um, and some of these teams will have to offload some of that. So like even if he went to the Suns, um, you know, if they did it via sign-and-trade, they would end up getting hard cap – by the first salary cap apron, which is 172 million, um, which means they aren't going to have access to their mid-level exceptions. So uh, it, it, again, it's going to handicap them a ton. But if you compile that much talent between those four guys on the offensive end, you got to try, right? <laughs> you just have to. Yeah. You got to take a swing at it. So I understand. I understand it. But I, I think ultimately we'll probably see him stay in Dallas. I think the money that they can offer him. I think them having learned their lesson with Brunson last year is going to get Mark Cuban in a place where, okay, just even if you feel like you're paying more than you want to, like I'm sure they can probably find a way maybe get him on a two-year max, a three-year max. Maybe it's a two-and-one with a team option, whatever. Like mm-hmm. Find a little bit of language that's, that's beneficial to the Mavericks. So if they need to, they can you know kind of cut ties, but still give him the money because... 
Look, we saw when they were playing well together, Kyrie and Luka are very, very hard to stop. Yeah. Questions are always going to be the defensive side of things and the center position. Drafted Derek Lively to kind of help fill that gap. Bringing a guy like Rashawn Holmes. Josh Green continues to develop. I thought he was one of the better young role players in the league. Like, who knows, right? Who knows? But, um, again, hard to pass up on the ability to, to get the most amount of money from the Mavericks and, and continue to play with a guy like Luka. Um, next guy I have here is uh, Draymond Green who opted out of his $27.6 million player option, um, which was expected, right? All signs are still pointing towards him re-signing in Golden State. You know, they moved his his boxing opponent to, to Washington, got Jordan Poole <laughs> out of there. <laughs> his sparring partner. partner. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, in all seriousness, right, they moved Poole out, right? They, they free up a little bit of space there, getting his money off the books. Um potentially anything behind the scenes, any animosity between the two, you know, that's kind of dead and done with. Um, so it, it, to me, it makes sense. The Warriors are, would keep him right. Like, I don't think it's the best thing to do purely from a basketball standpoint. I think that it will handicap them in the long run. And you do, I think shorten the window that you have with Steph because they're all getting older and you really are going to, you know, tie yourself down with money where you potentially let Draymond walk and utilize that money to bring in, you know, more role players um, and, and build out a bigger roster around Stephen Clay. But at the same time, like I just said, you want to see guys start and finish their career with the same team. And, and that kind of gives you the option to have that core that won four championships together to retire all together as Golden State Warriors. And that would be you know, that would be a, a defining moment for that franchise and really how they shape this era of, of basketball here. So um, I think all things point to him staying in Golden State, but a team to look out for is Portland. There have been reports that if they're going to keep Damian Lillard, Draymond is a guy that he wants to play with. I think the fit there will be good. I think they're going to be moving off of Nurkic anyway, so you bring in a guy who can really hold it down on the defensive end. You bring in a seven-footer to play with them, um, you know, whoever that is. Um, I think he'd be great. Again, like we've already kind of alluded to on other episodes, like we know what the fit between him and Steph is, right? Mm -hmm. I think he could replicate a lot of that with Dame's ability to shoot. You then unlock a little bit of more of Dame's movement off ball, right? Yeah. Um, and if they're able to keep guys like Matisse Thibault on the roster, like Defense is a little little lockup. Um, so I think that's an interesting fit as well. Again, I still think the Warriors are going to be the front runners, but something to look out for there in Portland. Yeah, 100%. Um, it's tough for the Warriors because I feel like what, what they have to do in order to still contain is something that they're not going to want to do. Like They're mm -hmm. not going to want to move over Draymond. They're not going to really want to move off of Clay because at this point, Clay is not a number two option on a championship team. So, and I get it. Like you said, it's like... These guys have been together. They've been the dynasty. They brought you guys so many championships, so much success. It's like it feel kind of like a betrayal to move off of those guys. So I, I do believe he's coming back. But again, I pre I agree with everything you said. I think the best fit outside of the Warriors is Portland. You're gonna be playing with Steph Jr. over there, basically. <laughs> no disrespect. I'm just saying, like they play so similar, yeah. And like it it would just work so well over there. So I I think the best fit the best fit outside of the Warriors is definitely Portland. But again, I just I don't see him in anything other than a Warriors uniform, if I'm being honest. I'm a I'm gonna make sure I say it before we move on. He's from Detroit area, right? He's from Saginaw, Michigan. Mm -hmm. He's voiced before in the past that there's some want to maybe play for his hometown team and go back to Detroit. He's already got four rings. Like I'm not in his head. If I was him, obviously I want more rings. Yeah. <laughs> but you, know, you go to Detroit, pair up with, you know, Kay Cunningham and Jay Nivey and he'd the be young a great vet. they got there. Right. He'd be a great vet on, like, a young team. He'd be an amazing vet to have in the locker room. On the court in general, if you're bringing that championship experience, like, if he chose to do the, you know, I'm we, like you said, we won already. We've I've accomplished a lot in my career. If he chose to go that route, I, hey, I'm all for it. I'm definitely all for it. He's already a Hall of Famer. It's like... You don't have to prove yourself anymore, mm -hmm. but I, that would again be 
um, you saying like, all right, I'm I'm satisfied. Like I don't need any more rings because you're not gonna win anything in Portland. So, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm here for it if he chose to do that. Yeah, and again, Pistons are one of the teams with um, decent amount of cap space. Um, have the list pulled up here. They have 30 million in cap space, um, which I think is the was just the fifth most this off season. Um, I'm actually gonna go through all these teams. There's eight teams right now that have more enough cap space. Um, than the, the $12.4 million mid-level exception. Um, so the Rockets have the most by far, sitting at $60.9 million. Spurs are coming in second, $38.6 million. Kings have $35 million. Pacers got $32 million, which actually just jumped up earlier today to, I think, almost $36 million um, because they just moved off of Chris Dorte um, and sent him to the Kings for some draft compensation. So I don't know. It might do a little Brian Windhorse. Mm-hmm. They got going on over there. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah. And then, then you have the, the Pistons in there at 30 millions, 30 million jazz at 28, the magic at 23. And then the thunder sneakily 16 million in, in cap space. So, um, something just to look out for the, the Pistons have the cap space. He's voiced that he may want to eventually play for his hometown team. So I don't know. I think he's going to stay with the Warriors, but again, like you said, he'd be a great, a great vet. Um, moving on to. Another guy who is actually going to be one of the more highly touted free agents. He's been linked to Houston, has been kind of like the de facto landing spot for a while now. But um, And a lot of people are, are speculating that you know once free agency opens today that there's a done deal there for him in Houston. Um, but that guy is Fred Van Vliet. Um, the Raptors can out- offer him up to five years, $233 million. Um, another team can give him four years, 173 million. Um, the, the words that have been coming out a lot of the reporters right now is that the Rockets are planning on giving him a max contract, but on a two-year deal, so not tying down their money super long term, but bringing in a guy who can really be a, a point guard for them, help to aid in the development of some of their younger guys in Jalen Green and, and Shangun and Amen Thompson and, and people like that. So. Um, Rockets have been one of the, uh, the the biggest front runner for Fred Van Vliet. I think some other teams, again, all going back to the, the cap and the contract that he's going to command, um, you know, wanting almost forty million a year, which that's a lot of money to give to Fred Van Vliet. That's it is a, a lot, lot of money off of a I, so-so year. Yeah, look, I I agree. I think forty M's is is a little steep for Fred. But again, these teams do have to spend, this is part of the new CBA, mm-hmm. by the first day of the regular season, teams have to spend 90% of the cap, which is, I don't remember the official number, but it's like $170 million, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so, look, if you got the money, you have to spend it. Right. So that's why I think the Rockets makes the most sense there. And, you know, you may be able to bring in him plus a guy like Dylan Brooks or Brooke Lopez. Um uh, bringing two vets for a team that is in desperate need of them, um, but has one of the best young cores. So I think Houston is a no-brainer fit. Another team that I think I really like him on, and they do have the cap space potentially to try to get that deal done, um, they would not be able to give him the same size of contract as a uh, as the Rockets would. But I'm just looking at this from a fit perspective. The Orlando Magic, they have a log jam there with their, their guard position that, you know, between Markel, Jalen Suggs, Cole Anthony, and then you just bring in Anthony Black as well. But you already have your, your core guys, right? You have Paolo, you have Franz. Um, I, I probably would also throw Wendell into that mix there as well. If you're able to move off of maybe Markel and Suggs, whatever, um, obviously you're going to keep Anthony Black. You bring in Fred. That's a very nice core they have going. Paolo's only going to continue to get better. Fraud's only going to continue to get better. Um, and I think then, right, you clear up the log jam at the guard spot. Anthony Black kind of has a defined role. Um, there's not a ton of guys he's going to be competing minutes for, so he can get some good run and start to develop early on in his rookie season. Um, so I think the, Magics would be a, the Magic would be an interesting fit for Fred Van Vliet. Um, and I like what he could bring to that team. Um, and I like his fit just around Franz and Paolo. 
um, and, and the space that he can bring to that that lineup as well. All right. You're you're okay with the idea of moving off of Markel? That's kind of what people have been assuming is going to happen just with, like I said, how many guards they kind of now brought in, especially with the addition of Anthony Black. Um, if I was them, if I had to pick between Jalen Suggs, Cole Anthony, and Markel, I might keep Markel, to be honest with you. I really liked what I saw from him last year. I think it's a great story. Like, it's a good story for him. Like, he's really, I think, kind of found a, a role that fits um, mm-hmm. after, you know, obviously some of the injury stuff that he went through earlier in his time um, with Philly. But um, I, I think Markel is great. I think he fits well with that roster. I think he um, took a lot of strides as a playmaker this past year. Um, and I just really like the fit for him there in, in Orlando. So from a, just a pure basketball perspective, I would be cool with them – keeping Markel and like letting him be their point guard for real for real for this season and like let's really see how it goes like let's really align that and you can still then move off of Suggs and Cole Anthony or one of them um and potentially look to to bring in draft compensation things like that and just continue to build up around the the core that you have there so if I was a Magic that's what I would do and I might spend my money elsewhere but um Again, I could see them going down the route where they move off of Markel and Suggs or, you know, Suggs and Cole Anthony. Like, you got to move off of probably two of those guards to bring in a guy like Fred. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I definitely hear what you're saying. I, funny, though, I think um, a little bit a little bit off topic. I think if Markel was to go to another team, I think he has a, a chance to be like a— like, you know how Andrew Wiggins was, Aaron Gordon mm-hmm. was, former high, high draft pick. Didn't really pan out in their, their first— first situations i think if he can go to another team and i'm not saying whatever team he goes to is winning a championship but he can definitely be one of those guys where he changes the way he's viewed at because he's kind of, he's already doing that in in the magic in orlando like he mm-hmm. had a, a good season looks like he's bounced back a lot so i think he definitely has a chance to be the next like andrew wiggins aaron gordon like helping a real contending team compete for a championship and being like a key piece and like changing the narrative so if, if they move off him, I wouldn't be opposed to it. I, I just hope he would go to a good team, or at least a team where he can continue to improve and continue having this little bounce back, uh, this little resurgence. But going back to Fred Van Vliet, um, I pretty much agree with everything you said with the Rockets, just because, like you said, they have to spend the money, mm-hmm. and they need veterans in there. So I don't think, because I've seen a lot of people think that it would stop the, or like stunt the growth of like a Amen Thompson, um, just because they just drafted him. I don't really see that. I think he can help him just because, like you said, he's a veteran. He has mm-hmm. that experience in the playoffs. He has that experience in championship. It's like, I, I think he I think he can benefit. Like you said, I don't think it should be a long-term deal. Um, yeah, but no. you got to spend the money somewhere. And bringing in, I think, him along with Dylan Brooks will be good because I think Dylan Brooks could slide into that, that uh, small forward spot, bring that mm-hmm. defense, bring that veteran – leadership i know he's been a little bit questionable with the leadership but <laughs> at the end of the day he's a veteran he's been in the league for a while and he brings defense which you desperately need so him along with fred van vliet i think it, i think it'd be good for the rockets to bring in at least at least two two of those veterans in there so i, I like the rockets fit a lot for fred van vliet yeah and, and another thing just to note with a lot of these a lot of these guys right there are always is sign and trade options um and if, if i'm toronto if you aren't able to re-sign him, which I think is a possibility that they're able to try to keep him just because rumors already have been coming around that they might uh, keep um, Jakob, right? And so, like, mm-hmm. if you do that, it really feels like you're going to just run it back with this core again. And so why would you let Fred walk for free? Like, if you can keep him, keep him. If not, the next best option is you at least sign him and flip him for something. Right. Um, instead of just losing him for free. So something to keep in mind that the Raptors could potentially do there as well um, with Fred. Now, I want to get into the, the Milwaukee guys because this is interesting. Mm-hmm. One of them, the you know, the rumors have been out that he's probably going to be staying in Milwaukee. That's Chris Middleton, even though he declined 40 M's. It was just crazy <laughs> his to player see. option. That was wild. <laughs> um, so he's been linked to to stay, and a lot of that is due to 
you know, when they had their head coaching uh, search and they're, you know, in meetings with Adrian Griffin, it wasn't just Giannis meeting with him. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, it wasn't even Giannis and Drew. It was Giannis and Chris that are in the meetings with Adrian Griffin. And so that I think is telling to where his mindset is. Because if you're thinking about, you know, waiving your player option and going elsewhere, why do you even get involved in that aspect of the, the coaching search, right? You to wouldn't be, do all to that. Be, to be fair, though, James Harden was a big reason Doc got fired yeah, and now true. he's requesting a trade. That, that is true. I honestly forgot about that when we were talking about him. That's kind of crazy when you really think about it. But either way, I think he was gone regardless. But I just think it's crazy how he was. Listen, people could make insight to coaching decisions and then still be up out of there. I don't think that's what's going to happen with Middleton, but I just yeah. thought that was interesting. Yeah, I think ultimately um, he can get a five-year, $272 uh, million dollar contract with the Bucks. With another team, it can be a four-year, $202 million dollar max. Um, but... Again, it just it feels like he's gonna stay in Milwaukee. I feel like it'd be weird to break up that tandem. Again, we already know they can win a ring with the core that they have there. Um, so I think he'll probably end up staying in in Milwaukee. But we have the player option, so he is a, a free agent. So something just to to keep in mind. But going to the other Bucks player who has been essentially almost a done deal to go to the Rockets. It sounds like. Um, for basically since the, the start of this whole free agency rumors began, is Brooke Lopez, which going back to the Rockets fit, I like that fit a lot. You bring in Brooke, what that then allows you to do is you can play him and Shingun side by side. I think that's very doable because of the floor spacer that Brooke has become later in his career, right? That then gives you options at you know, if you bring in a guy like Dylan Brooks, okay, you start him at the three, maybe Jabari Smith comes off the bench, possibility. If you want to go super big, maybe you put Jabari at the three. If you don't bring a guy like Dylan Brooks, you still have Tari Eason who could play the three. There's some versatility there. You're bolstering your bench because somebody's got to go to the bench. Um, and again, if you just brought in Fred and Brook, that starting lineup can be Fred, Jalen Green. At the three, you could have Tari Eason. Or Jabari Smith, you know, whichever one you like. Al Perrin at the four. Brooke Lopez at the five. You've got people holding it down on defense. You've got great, two great ball handlers, people that can create for themselves. Fred Van Vliet can create for others. Jalen Green um, hopefully becomes more efficient, having another really strong ball handler. Not, no slight against KPJ, but Fred Van Vliet is in a, a different tier of player. Um, and again, you're bringing in a guy who was a defensive player of the year candidate. And a, and a former champion, right? Two former champions, right? You bring in two former champions as the vets on your mm -hmm. team. I think if they're able to do that, granted, they they flesh out a lot of money for those two contracts. You know, maybe there's shorter deals that you can be done with in a few years. I like that for Houston a lot. I think at worst, you at least are bringing in the vets that continue to get in these guys' ears and like, Start running your team like an NBA organization and not an AAU team on the court. Um, right. With 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 pairing a, of Ime too, like as good as Brook has been on defense, like you're about to get him to a guy who we saw take the Celtics defense to another level. So, look, I think that that would be a slam dunk free agency window for the Rockets. I like both of those fits together. So, Brook to Houston makes a ton of sense to me. But he has come out on the record. And said that the most important thing to him is winning. Going to Houston, you're, you're not going to be a contender. Definitely not now. So, I don't know. Potential for him to stay in uh, Milwaukee is still there. But it's going to be tough. Um, again, just with the money that they would have to, to give out. Especially if they are able to re-sign Middleton. Yeah, 100%. Um the Rockets are definitely, in my opinion, going to get at least, I think, at least two between Van Vliet, Brooks, and uh, who am I missing? Who am I missing? Brooke Lopez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, between Van Vliet, Brooke Lopez, and Dylan Brooks. Yes, you're right. Yeah. Um, I think they're going to get at least two of those guys. Um, like you said, they have to spend this money. And I think those all are great fits for them. Like you said, I think that 
we talk, we've heard Ime talk about how they love Shingoon, but they want to get bigs who do different things in there. And I think Brook Lopez and Shingoon can work very well together. Um, he can still space the floor, so it's not like he's clogging up the paint. I think Brook Lopez is, is a is a great center to have on your team because give you elite rim protection and still space the floor, which is very very rare. I feel like in um in today's NBA, so I like that I like that fit for them a lot. I think that the Rockets are gonna give give him an insane offer. So it's really going to show if he really wants to stay and win a ring mm -hmm. if he declines that Rockets offer just because they have so much money. And as heavy, as all in as they're going in on Brook Lopez, this offer is probably going to be something insane. So if he turns this down, and he's a man of his word because they're probably going to give him a bag. But, yeah, I, it's it's tough, too, because if he leaves the Bucks, I think that's a big loss for them. I, I really a do. It's a huge loss. Is, you might legitimately play Giannis at your five. You might have to. You really might have to, because then you'll probably start Bobby Portis. Right. And like we've we talked about before, you can't just have any center in there. We honest, like your team has to be con has to be constructed a certain way mm -hmm. in order for him to reach his max potential. Basically, in order for teams not to just build that wall and right. keep him out of that paint. So if he, if he leaves the Bucks, that could be a huge loss for them. Huge loss. Um, Literally, I have a list of all the players right here. And next to Brook Lopez, I have the Bucks, I have the Rockets, and I have a little, a little asterisk right there, the Lakers. I said, just, just in case. Just Again, in case. <laughs> listen, yeah, yeah. Actually, he's a different player now. He's a, he's a different player now. So you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Just, just keep an eye out on that. You know what I'm saying? If he really don't, if he really don't care about the money, I mean, if he, if he want to win a ring, hey man. I wore this shirt today for a reason, cause so one of these guys is coming on my team between Brook, between Bruce Brown, Brook Lopez. I need one of these free agents. Somebody got to come to the league. <laughs> oh well, speaking of the Rockets, this is a little bit of a wild card. This is <clears throat> this isn't attached to no rumors. This isn't attached to speculation. This is solely based on Rockets fit and just me thinking about what would make sense for that team. We just talked about how much they would throw at Fred Van Vliet. What if you could go and get a guy on a significantly smaller contract to fill a similar type of role, almost like a prove-it deal, right? Yeah, you go exactly in, one-year deal, right? It'd be your PG. Why not try D'Angelo Russell? I didn't think you were going to see D'Angelo Russell. Okay, okay. I like that. Why like not it. go for it, right? Because... You bring in a guy who has playoff experience, bring in a veteran type of guy. I think he can play with, you know, uh, with Jalen Green. You know, you still, you're definitely going to save money. Again, like, I think this could be a prove-it type deal. Nowhere near as big as what you give Fred Van Vliet. It could be a one-year contract. Let D'Lo come and say, you know, you come in, be a vet. Help us get our guys right. Right? And at the same time, you who? You raise your value, you can go get a better contract next year. Mm -hmm. It's a win-win situation for both sides. So, again, like I said, there is no rumors that I'm going off of to even say this. This is solely just, if I was Steven Silas, not Steven Silas, if I was uh, Raphael Stone, uh, and I'm looking through these free agents and who we target, D-Lo would be somebody I keep in the back of my head. That if we can't get Fred Van Vliet's number down a little bit, I just want to see. I just want to see what we could potentially get D'Lo for. Because if you get him on a, a good deal, maybe it's, you know, $18, $20 million one year. Come in, plays well, puts up 20-plus a night, has a good season in, in, you know, Houston. He can go and get a longer contract, bigger contract next year. And then you're able to say, you know, you developed your guys, maybe uh, amend your guy moving forward. And you, you just basically elevate him into the starting spot the following season. And you just continue to rebuild around that core. So that is something I would consider if I was Houston. Yeah, I'm not mad at it. I actually didn't think you were going to say that. When you said prove a deal, it made more sense. I, I don't know why. I thought you were talking about like a Gabe Vincent type of guy just because you don't have to spend as much money. He's a guy that can go there. And I definitely don't think he would, he would hinder the, the, the growth of no. those other young players on the team. So... Um, I like I like the D'Lo fit. I definitely do. My only my only concern is the fact that he doesn't. I still don't view him as like a pass first guy. No, he's definitely um, still a score first guard. Yeah. So I, 
in a in a perfect world, I would really want a guy in there that could like get shots to these young guys that can help mm-hmm. them. They gotta go through these growing pains. They gotta get these shots up. They gotta experience what it's like to be the guys on team to see if they can be the guy moving forward. So, mm-hmm. but but I definitely don't. I definitely don't hate the fit at all. I I like it uh, for D'Lo, especially just the one year deal. Get your value up, then you can go somewhere else after that. I've seen that talked about with. Well, I've never. You're the first one I heard with the Rockets. I've seen like the Utah Jazz be an option yep. for D'Lo just because they they seem like they desperately need a point guard. They have all. They seem like they got all these forwards. They're about to run Laurie at the one at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I, a team like the Jazz, just somewhere where he can get his value up if he doesn't resign with the Lakers. So I, I definitely could see that. Yeah, and yeah, I just I, I feel like. That would be better than bringing in Fred on thirty mil a year, thirty five mil a year, forty mm-hmm. mil a year, even if you're trying to give him the full max deal, because right. um, then that may enable you to get Brooke Lopez and Dylan Brooks, right? Yeah. And you can bring in three pretty decent, you know, free agents, um, and and really have have something there in Houston. But to your point about him not being a pass first guy, I think. And I know I've seen a lot of Rockets fans think the same. Their offense looked best last year when they were running through Shingun. That's true. And so if if they constructed in a way where, you know, Shingun is kind of being the, not like the full-blown engine. Right, like trying to think in that vein, he's not anywhere near that level of talent right now. Right. Mm-hmm. But like, he does have the tools and the skill set to potentially grow into that kind of player. So you bring in a guy like Dilo who may not be the greatest playmaker, but you have Shengun and you can do a lot of facilitating there. And like I said, if you bring in Brooke, the spacing is great. He can kind of be in the post, work out of the, the low block, high block, free throw line, whatever. You got shooters surrounding him. A lot of DHO action you could run. Like You could get a very versatile offense that way. And so I think Dilo not being as much of a playmaker, while obviously it has its cons, could be a pro if you structure it in the right sense that you then open up that skill set for Shingun to really flourish and develop in that way. So but I'm just saying that is something that the Rockets should consider. Like, I, I wouldn't be so all in on just Fred Van Vliet when you have some of these other very capable guards on the market. And it's not like you're in a win now mode right now. You're really just trying to bring in vets and guys that can complement the development of your guys. And I think bringing in a guy like that, Pushes a little bit more of the playmaking onto Shangun, which will be great for his development long term. Because if you have him and Jalen Green as really your, your franchise cornerstones, and also Amen Thompson as well, if he you know continues to be the projection that, that he's on, I really like that a lot. Um, and side note, both the Thompson twins, like I saw Kenny on Through the Wire say this, like I am rooting for them. Like all 100%. of the interviews that I've yeah. seen of them, like. They have some of the best mental that I've seen out of some of these rookies. Like, even the fact, like, he showed up to the, the Rockets, like, introductory press conference in a suit. Like, he in is a business. I, he is a very, very professional rookie. Like, yeah. of all the people in that locker room that could probably use a vet, he might be a vet to Jalen Green, like, it feels like at, already, right? At like, this point, yeah. Like, he just seemed like, bro, they're just so calm they seem mm-hmm. like they they're like you said very professional like bro look, they, listen i hope these guys really pan out i really yeah. really do i really hope these guys pan out and like like i've seen that same thing you're talking about can you talking about i have no horse or horse in this race like i have no reason to root for the rockets but like i really do hope these guys pan out the rockets in in detroit so but um i think the rockets are in a very very weird spot in a good way like they have all of this cap space but they have so many young they have so many players already like they have so many young players already like they're in a like a like i said it's a weird spot but it's a good weird it's like you're you're rich basically yeah and you already have the core like you have the young guys like they're they're in a they're in a really good spot like we've talked about it before the rockets in a couple years if they make all the right moves and they have the coach in a Mm -hmm. couple years they can be scary like legitimately scary. So that's going to be interesting to see for years to come. Yeah, I think the best case scenario is you bring in guys on a on two-year deals, three-year deals, nothing crazy long, no five-year, no huge max contracts, right? 
Mm-hmm. You bring in those deals. You get guys who complement your young core. You continue to let them develop, right? And when those contracts are up, all of a sudden now we've freed up cap space at a time where we could go and get a guy that we pair him with. Now we're looking at like a year five Jalen Green, mm-hmm. a year five six Shengun, right? Year four Jabari, year three Amen Thompson is like we can make some noise, right? So it's like you are you got salary at a good you have a cap now, and you put yourself in a position where you have cap at a time where you can actually go and try to make the contending move, mm-hmm. you know? So if they can do that right, I think they can really really sweep free agency. Like, like I said, they almost have doubled the next closest team's cap. So they go in and make the right moves. Like, Rockets are in a very – it's a hard spot to mess this up, I think. 100%. And somebody has to pan out. There's no way between Jalen Green, Amen Thompson, uh, Jabari, Jabari Smith – I almost said Jabari Parker. Jabari Smith <laughs> and Shingun. You can't miss on four of those guys. Yeah. Like, you just it, – like, it's just probability mm-hmm. at this point. They, they can't all miss. So, right. they, like you said, they're in a really good spot. All right, and I'm already confident in, in Jalen Green. I think the biggest knock people give on him is his efficiency, which is, I mean, that's a fair criticism. At the same time, bro, he's a young player on a on very, a bad very team. bad team. Like yeah, this yeah. is the these are same conversations that people had about Devin Booker, right? Mm-hmm. And now, now Devin Booker might be the best shooting guard in the NBA, right? right? Like it when you're a very good player on a bad team with no structure, right? You don't even have vets like that, right? Mm-hmm. So. You, it's this. These are inevitable. Like your efficiency isn't going to be great, right? But if you bring in guys and you kind of help him mold a, a healthier, better shot diet, that efficiency starts to catch up. That point per game might take another leap up from twenty to twenty four, twenty five. Like I think Jalen Green is legit. I believe in Shangun. I really like watching him in person. Like watching the Rockets games from last year, he really does show those flashes of like. That was kind of Sabonis like. That was kind of Jokic like, right? Like, just his ability to play make as a big man. Um, so like, I, they just I don't know what they could do to mess this this free agency period up. Like, you just mm-hmm. bring in guys who do not detrimentally hinder your you know your your young player development, and it's a win. Mm-hmm. Moving on to some of the other. Uh, Undra- undrafted, unrestricted free agents. Kyle Kuzma, who is, uh, he's got a couple of uh, decent suitors across the league. Um, another guy that's that's linked to the Rockets, potentially. Again, the Rockets are going to be linked to about every single team in free agency just with the money. Right. Um, but another team that he had been linked to for a long time, and I actually really like the fit, was Sacramento. Now, Sacramento did... Um, extend Harrison Barnes yesterday or the day before so that seems a little less likely now just they don't have as much money to be able to offer to a guy like Kuzma Um, and then even if they did you know do they bench Keegan Murray who really came on for them in the in the playoffs last year like we seemed like he really took that step all rookie guy so I I wouldn't want to go that route if I was Sacramento Um, so Kuzma who I you know I do not think is going to be going back to Washington um, is going to have a decent amount of suitors um, across the league just because of his skill set, his ability to score, his length, um, and additionally, his um, his ability to rebound. He's really turned into a really great rebounder um, during his time in Washington. So um, Kuz was going to be another name to watch out for here in this free agency period. Yeah, I was a little upset that they um... – extended Harrison Barnes because I really wanted Kuzma mm-hmm. to go to Sacramento that's I think when we talked about this before that's the first thing that I said was was Sacramento I really wanted him to go there so um I'm a little upset that they did that but I mean it's still somewhat of a possibility like you said the Rockets are always going to be there um like I said they're going to get some <laughs> one of these free agents they're going to get at least two if not three of these guys so yeah that one and a team that you brought up uh before the Pacers I feel like would be a good fit for Kuzma they have the cash space. Mm-hmm. They can give him a good amount of money. So I think he would work well with them. Yeah, right. And we just mentioned a little bit ago, right, them moving off of Dorte boosts their cap space a little bit. Um, so I, I would like Kuzma in Indiana. Um, I don't think it catapults them into, you know, Eastern Conference contention. But they would definitely be a playoff team um, with the, the group of guys that they got there now. 
Um, and, and bringing in a guy like Kuzma, I think, only, only helps that out. So I like that a ton for them. Um, another guy who is a, one of the bigger unrestricted free agents here is Jeremy Grant. Um, now, again, it's been reported that that's a guy that Dame still wants to play with. I think he, he fits there. Um, but if you go and potentially are trying to also go after a guy like Draymond Green, like is Damon, Damon, is Damian Lillard, Draymond, and Jeremy Grant, like what, what is that doing in the West? Nothing. Nothing at all. That's a, right. that's a second round, first round exit, depending on your seed. Like, no, that's not doing anything. Yeah, so, I, uh, again, so much of what Portland does in this free agency really is going to come down to are they or are they not going to keep or move Dame? And I already said we're not going to sit here and talk about this because I'm tired of just hearing the rumors back and forth. So, I'm not going to do it. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Just know that that's a big component to where um, Jeremy Grant could end up. But do you have any spots around the league where you think Jeremy Grant could potentially be a good fit? Um, Honestly, just because of the Dame stuff, I haven't even been thinking about Jeremy Grant because I don't know what he's going to do. Like, mm-hmm. I really don't know what he's going to do. So, honestly, I haven't really put much thought to it. That's another guy, I mean... It was tough with the Harrison Barnes thing. I think I like I like the idea of a of a forward who are is long, athletic, and can still score, can bring you something offensively. I always like the idea with the Kings. So all of those guys I linked with the Kings. It's a little bit I don't, it's a little bit tougher now with the Harrison Barnes thing. Like when I seen it, I genuinely was just like, I don't know. I I felt like bringing in a guy like that or Kuzma, who is a little bit closer to your timeline, would have worked better than extending an older didn't show up in the playoffs Harrison Barnes so that was a little bit tough for me but other than that I don't really have a team that just jumps out like boom I I can see this being a perfect fit for them but at the end of the day he's still he's a long I think he's what like 6'10 like Mm -hmm. those type of guys can fit on a lot of teams so it's like there's going to be a lot of teams that can use that type of player it's just tough that there's only eight teams with cap space in general that can bring in a guy like that let me look something up really quick because I want to see what his shooting percentage has been um, this past season. Shot he shot forty percent from three this past year. Oh my gosh! Damn. So you know what that makes me think. And again, this is not rumors; it's just me looking at fit. If the Bucks lose Chris Middleton, but you brought in Jeremy Grant. Who I think it's a debate to be made about defense there potentially. Like Chris Milton is a good defender, but I think Jeremy Grant is in that same echelon, if not maybe better. Um, a little bit of a bigger body, right? Like Jeremy Grant is 6'8, 210. Um, this past season, like I just said, 40% from three on almost six threes a game. Like that's really good efficiency. Mm-hmm. Um, had one of his highest effective field goal percentages of his career. Um, put up 20 a night um, with, with almost five rebounds as well. And, and a steal and a block. Like, I think he could fit well in Milwaukee. And you definitely do not pay him as much as you would have to pay uh, Chris Milton, which would then enable you to go out and go and get another person in free agency to try to retool this roster around Giannis. Now, again, I still think they're going to keep Chris because – you know, that was a guy that was critical to them winning that you know, championship in the first place. But saying if he walks or even if he doesn't, something for the Milwaukee Bucks to potentially consider just in terms of the size of the contract that you would have to pay Jeremy Grant compared to Chris Middleton. And I think the fit next to Giannis still works, right? Like you still have the spacing. You still have a switchable big um, kind of defender. So... I could see I could see Milwaukee being an interesting fit there for Jeremy Grant if he doesn't go back to Portland. Yeah, if he if he doesn't if 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 Milton leaves, I could definitely see that. I could definitely see that. The only concern with me only concern would be I think Middleton was very big in like clutch moments in most of their playoff. Yeah, you runs. lose a you lose a closer for sure. You yeah, that's what I'm saying. So would Drew Holiday be able to step up? 
is Giannis going to improve his shot to the point where he can be somewhat of a closer? I don't think see that happening. Yeah, it's hard to make that big of a jump in one off season. Mm-hmm. But it it definitely be interesting if they were to lose Chris Middleton. Yeah. Um. Let's let's pivot here. Let's pivot here to a guy who is, might be on a really really low contract this year. Um, Russell Westbrook. Obviously, one of the more polarizing players in the league, especially in the last two seasons, right? We saw mm-hmm. what happened with the with the Lakers, and then at the same time, he goes to the Clippers and balled out. If Kawhi is able to stay healthy, like who knows what happens in that first round series against the Suns? Because he was hooping, he, he was, was hooping. He was I think really he good. he made it clear to anybody that didn't believe he still is a starting point guard. In the NBA, right? He still has a lot of gas left in the tank. Is always going to be one of the biggest high energy guys in the NBA, right? That motor is on another level. Um, he's a guy that that the Clippers are hoping to get back on almost a hometown deal. I think it was under four million dollars a year. That's crazy. Which, to me, like he's worth way more than that. Like way more than that. I think he's still worth at least like. 18 to 20 mil. I think he's still worth that. Because he's right. on what? What is he? He was on what? Like 35 this past? Yeah, he was on a cra- he was on a crazy deal. Crazy yeah, deal. Yeah, like he was on something ridiculous. I still think he's worth like, like yeah, like 15 to 20. I say, I say 20. Mm-hmm. I give him 20. Right. And even on a contending team, like, bro, 4 million for Westbrook is crazy. That's a crazy that's a, deal. That's, that's, a that's insane value, right? Yeah. Like, but. No, I think even the mid level is almost like thirteen million dollars. Like if he signs somewhere and signs for a mid level exception, like I could see that potentially. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think Westbrook, obviously, if they can keep him um, with the Clippers, that makes a ton of sense. Um, just you know, we already saw the fit with with him and Kawhi there, um, and what he was able to bring for them in the playoffs. Um, and who knows if they're able to bring in a guy like Harden. Maybe you have Westbrook as your six man, and he comes in and runs that second unit, and it's just like you give him the ball and let him be free, let him be Russell on the court, and you know who knows that gives you options then in terms of closing units. Like maybe Hart is there, maybe he's not, maybe Russ is in. Like you have options there depending on what you need and how they're playing in that moment. So um, even if they bring in a guy like James Harden, I think keeping Russ could be you know very beneficial for the for the Clippers. 100%. Um, I think the Clippers are probably one of the only places that he can play and be and be effective while winning. Because we've seen Russell Westbrook on bad teams and teams that the, it's not really a great fit. He's going to put up his numbers. Like, even if you put him on a team where he's the guy, which I don't think he'll go to any one of these teams and he'll be the guy, like any team that's out there, um, that he would actually go to. But the Clippers, it just fits so well. With, with Russell Westbrook's play style, like they have the shooters around him, they have good defenders, and we've seen when he wants to, he can pick up the defensive intensity. Like in that series, he was legitimately guarding Kevin Durant. Legitimately, he wasn't locking him up, but he was making plays, making him uncomfortable. Like he, like Westbrook fits so well with the Clippers. I know he probably wants to stay in LA. That's where he's from. So I just think four million. <laughs> Is definitely uh, he's undervalued there, but I mean, as far as fit wise, as far as still being able to win a championship and stay in the place you want to stay in, I think he should just stay with the Clippers. I think that's the best place for him. Um, yeah, I, I don't really see another place where there's there's other places where he can go, but he doesn't fit with like every single superstar well, especially yeah. at this point in his career. So mm-hmm. I, think he, I definitely think he should just stay with the Clippers. Yeah, I, I think him staying with the Clippers is the best for both sides, right? Because mm-hmm. anywhere else, it's, it's going to be hard for him to fit on a lot of these other teams that are really contending. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're him, like, I wouldn't go and try to go be a vet on a you know a young, you know, developing team like at this point in career. I don't think he career. could do that. I don't think he could do that. Like, I mean, he can, but like, I, I just, I don't want my vet being Westbrook. Like, no disrespect to him, I just don't want my vet being Westbrook. I think he would hinder like we i would never see him one on the rockets like i don't oh yeah no like he would like stunt the growth of my my guys he would want to do everything 
which is mm-hmm. like I don't I'd rather I'd rather my young guys mess up than Westbrook just try to do everything. So yeah, I can see that. I can definitely see that. Um, we're gonna go over to a guy that may not be one of the bigger names we haven't touched on yet, but somebody that I think could fit on a team that I don't think we've really talk, talked on at all today. That's a guy like Bruce Brown, who declined his player option, been linked to the Lakers with the, the mid-level exception, right? It starts at, well, I just said, like 12.6, 12.7 million, um, which I still think is a steal for somebody of his caliber, honestly. Like, I think he could go and get more. Um, hey, man, don't say that too loud. <laughs> but well, let's, start, let's start with the Lakers. How do you think Bruce Brown would fit on the on the Lakers. Oh my God, that'd be so perfect. If we get Bruce Brown, that would be perfect, bro. That is a guy who can shoot, who can defend, who is just we've seen he can be like a glue guy. He can be a hustle guy. He can rebound like he he did all like the dirty work when he was with Brooklyn, and then when he went to the Nuggets, we see how much he improved offensively. He was based he was a point guard who was a, who could attack the basket, who could create his own shot. Man, like that, it would just be a beautiful fit, especially if we lose a guy like Schroeder. Even if we re sign D'Lo and then we have Bruce Brown, the times where D'Lo disappears in the playoffs, we plug in Bruce Brown right there, he's closing games for us. I just, oh my God. We, I need to re sign Austin Reeves, re sign Rui, bring in Bruce Brown, and I got a perfect offseason. I'm happy. We don't need to bring in nobody else. I'll have a perfect offseason. I got a team that we have not touched on at all today that I think Bruce Brown would go to and make a huge difference. Hold on, hold on. Is it a contender? Nah, I wouldn't say they're a contender. Alright. I have yet. two names I have two names on here. I just wanted to see if there was the ones you're talking about. Is it OKC? No, it's not. But that would be okay. interesting too. Okay, okay. Is it Utah? No. Okay. What team is it? It is the Cleveland Cavaliers. Okay. Right. They've been looking. That's what this team has needed for a while now. They need a small forward. Mm-hmm. Right. Everything else is set in stone. They've tried different guys there at the three spot. Isaac Okor was supposed to be the guy that hasn't fully panned out. They brought in Karis LeVert. That, I think, he's not going to be on the team next year. Like That didn't really do what it needed to do. Mm-hmm. I think you bring in a guy like Bruce Brown, right? Somebody that can handle the ball, right? If if needed to. Obviously, he's given up a little bit of size there, but you have Mobley and Allen, and Mobley's one of the most switchable bigs, right? Defensive player of the year candidate. So I think, you know, you're still solid there. It's tough because you already have a smaller backcourt with, with DG and Donovan, but just, you know, hear me out. Bruce Brown is still a great defender, right? So mm-hmm. he can he can potentially work on some of the guards there on that side of the ball, um, and somebody that we know can space the floor. Right, he doesn't need to have the ball in his fan, his hands to be effective. Can be a catch and shoot guy. Um, you know, can play in a very flowy offense as we just saw in Denver. Even when he was in Brooklyn, he used to be the he used to set screens and be the screen a and roll. Right, he would screen and roll and make some fantastic passes out of the short roll. So that could provide a new level of of options on their offense there. And then you finally, I think, get somebody to solidify that three spot there. And then you have a starting lineup of Darius Garland, Donovan Mitchell, Bruce Brown, Evan Mobley, Jared Allen. That's a very good team. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, like to really get into about the money. They can offer him the same, you know, mid-level exception that the Lakers can. So if he wants, to, if he wants to go and play for LA, he can get the same type of money in Cleveland. Play with with Donovan and DG and Evan Mobley, and that also still gives Cleveland the option to, they wanted to move off of Jared Allen, which has kind of started to been the some rumors have swirled about that. Um, they can move off of Jared for another. You know, wing guy, move Mobley to the five, and who knows what that lineup could look like. Like, you get an improved, you know, wing player, then mm-hmm. that kind of negates some of that size issue there. Um, Mobley, I think, 
obviously he's a good enough defender, I think, to play the five. It may be a little bit early to ask him to make that leap already, but, you know, I just think that would be a very, very interesting fit um, for Bruce Brown, and I think would be really good for both parties. I think he would be able to, again, shine in a very small role for that team and finally fill that gap that the Cavs have had for a while. Okay. I like it. No, I definitely like that fit. Like you said, bring it gives them exactly what they're looking for. So I, I like it a lot. Um, I just want to ask you because another team that he was linked to was the Dallas Mavericks. Mm-hmm. How do you how do you feel about that fit? I think that that makes a ton of sense too. For the a lot of the reasons that we've talked about, the Mavericks deficiencies being they need defenders, right? You bring in a guy who can we know can play defense. You bring in a guy who is a champion, right? Has played very big minutes for the Nuggets on their championship run. Um, and can slot there at the three. The only thing is, where does that put Josh Green in their rotation? Because you're not going to really be able to play to both of them at the same time because then you're you're giving up a lot of size, a lot of size at that point. That would be my only concern, but I know they've said that they are not wanting to trade Josh Green, but if you bring in Bruce Brown and that then makes Josh Green expendable, right? You move off of him and maybe like Sim Hardaway Jr.'s contract for some money, maybe a few pick swaps, whatever. Like you go get a disgruntled somebody and mm-hmm. that's a nice roster, right? Yeah. And then you actually then have kind of addressed some of those needs that we've had, we've talked about with them. Um, and who knows? So I, I like the fit on the Mavericks too. I think that makes a ton of sense on. Like, with the condition that they make moves to address some of the size. And then I don't, I don't just don't want to have Josh Green and Bruce Brown. Like, they're a little bit too similar of a player to me. Just from, a like, a size um, and what they can bring, especially on the, the offensive side of the ball. Um, like, it w- I just think it would be tough for all four of them to be playing at the same time when you're adding in Kyrie and Luka. Okay. Yeah, I just want to see how you feel about that figure. Those, those are just the two teams that I saw. Um, was the Mavericks and the Lakers that he was most heavily linked to. So it's going to be interesting to see where he goes. But come on, man. Come to L.A. Come to L.A., man. That, it, it would be a, a hit to the Nuggets and a plus for us. Man. Oh, I hope so. I really do. Well, we can keep on the L.A. train, right, and move into some of the top restricted free agents. And the Lakers have have two of them. In Austin Reeves and Rui Hachimura, um, both of them, like you already said, are the Lakers, some of their top priorities in free agency is to bring those two guys back. Both of them were critical to their run to the Western Conference Finals this past year. Rui's really flourished <laughs> now that he's no longer in Washington. Um, and Austin Reeves has really burst onto the scene. You know, he's playing for Team USA now. <laughs> Got goat. himself a signature shoe. Go, um, but but in all honesty, both those guys, you know, clearly fit, you know, with the Lakers. They play well with both LeBron and AD, which is very, very huge. They both space the floor. Austin Reeves has proven himself to be a capable ball handler um, and, and run the pick and roll, which is if you can run a pick and roll with LeBron playing off ball, like you have to be very, very good because he is not going <laughs> to allow that to happen to just anybody. So um, I, I think that. They will flesh out the money that they need to, um, to to keep both of those guys. But there are gonna be there are gonna be suitors in place. There have been, especially with Austin Reeves, there have been a lot of teams linked. Even a team like the San Antonio Spurs, like as much as we've talked about the Rockets here, Spurs have the second most cap space in the league. Um, and with Wemby, you got to bring in, you could bring in a guy now to, again, like, they're not going to be a contender anytime soon, like not this season, minimally. Um, so you could bring in a guy that just continues to, you want to elevate that floor, right? Mm-hmm. And so if you bring in a guy like Austin Reeves, potentially, like to pair up with Wemby and Devin Vassell and Keldon Johnson, if you end up keeping Keldon Johnson and Jeremy Sohan, like, 
interesting basketball. Like it's not gonna you're not gonna be no top seed in the West. Like you might be a playing team at best, but um, like you surround Wemby with guys who can score, can create for themselves, um, and maybe take some of the, the attention off of him and let him open the floor for him a little bit more. So I, I could see the Spurs being a team that might go ahead and just outbid um, the the Lakers here for a guy like Austin Reeves. I hear you. It sound good. It sound. It all sound good. He's a Laker, man. He's a Laker for life. Man. <laughs> he is a Laker for life. He fits too well. You got a chance to. You got a chance to uh, compete for a championship. You playing with LeBron. You playing with AD. You're in LA. Come on, man. Playing with in San Antonio not gonna get you a signature shoe. That's all I'm gonna say. It ain't gonna give you a signature shoe, Austin. It's not. It Pop definitely don't play like is that. not. <laughs> Listen, man. This, you, he gonna be a Laker, but if they. Because we said we're going to match anything up to 100 mil. If they just want to give him the bag, hey, man, be my guest. Like, go ahead. Good At that point, good for him. But I, I just think we're going to match pretty much anything that a team is going to offer for Austin Reeves. But Lakers fan aside, that fit in San Antonio would be really nice. I definitely would like that. Like you said, it raises the floor. Mm-hmm. It just gets, th- Those are the type of guys that I feel like you would love to have around Wimby just because... You're not bringing in a superstar, like it's right. gonna take the shine away, or like you, you're just gonna bring in a guy who can help that process move along faster. You know what I mean? And be like they, they're not gonna compete, but they want to be. They want to have make progress. Basically, they right. want to get to that point where they're gonna eventually compete. And I think Austin Reeves, alongside with Wimby, that's a, that's a definitely a great start. So it would be a good fit over there. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, and I'm a a quick sidebar like. I think that the Spurs are going to be a better team than people are accounting for. Like, <clears throat> Even if they don't make no moves, you mean? Just, like, they can have a roster as is right now. Like, mm-hmm. They're going to be a better team, I think, than people are expecting. I really think Wemby is going to come in and impact that team at a high level from the get-go. Like, He was just in the finals of the French basketball league, right? Like what we saw Luca come in and do like very early on, like that type of impact, I think is, I'm not saying like from a play perspective, like he's not about to be out here handling the ball and pick and roll and all that to that extent. But I'm just talking about the level of impact that he could have um, for a team like the Spurs in his first year. I think people are almost undervaluing that. Like he's not a regular rookie. (laughs) He's not a regular rookie. Mm -hmm. Like, if he stays healthy, like, and gets his whatever they're projecting, like, 26, 28 minutes a night, he's not going to play a ton of minutes. But, like, in those minutes, he's going to be very, very productive and help lead to a lot more wins, I think, than this past season. I could see the Spurs being a 30-plus win team this year. Like, obviously, health is needed for that. But um, they're going to have to bring in a couple of free agents. Like I said, they have to spend the money, raise that floor. Um, they've been linked to potentially moving off of Keldon Johnson. So you might move off of him for, you know, a young guy or whatever, and maybe another couple of role players. And like, I think that could really be a 31 team. Not going to be in the playoffs, right? At best, they might be a playing team. And if they sneak in, great. Like, but they're not going to get out of the first round, even if that was the case. But I just think they're not going to be this high level lottery team next year. That's not the Spurs MO. And I think that Wemby is on the level to to help propel them out of that. If you got to make a prediction, what do you think his rookie stat line is going to be? Stays healthy the whole year. Like, just around, like, what do you think his rookie stat line? I think he could probably put up 18 to 20 points a game. Probably giving you, what, seven, eight rebounds. I think what might really, really surprise people, he might put up, like, two plus blocks a game. I like, can see that easily. Like, I, I, He'd be up there with the block leaders, if, like, honestly. Right. What, Walker Kessler was one of the block leaders this past year as a rookie. Um, and Rudy played in the same league that he did as um, right before he came, came into the NBA. I think somebody said that Wemby had, I think it was... 50 more blocks than Rudy in his last season in the French League with, like, almost similar amount of minutes played. It's like, okay, so the guy that came in and became a three-time defensive player of the year 
one of the best rim protectors statistically and like even the high test like of all time. This guy was doing more at his age with the same type of, of you know, minutes. Mm-hmm. I think he could come into to San Antonio and give you about 20 and 8, maybe an assist or two, and like 2.2 blocks per game. Like elite rim protection, just like size alone. Like he measured in at like, I think, 7, 3 and a half and no shoes officially. It was like, mm-hmm. okay, put some shoes on, bro. He's 7, 5. You're right. Like, he's going to be erasing shots at the rim all year. So, I think that off the rip, he's going to he's gonna be a ridiculous mismatch on the offensive end. But he's going to be a great weak side rotator at just spiking stuff off the rim. Yeah, that's why we said. I, I mean, I think we both agree. Barring injury, I don't think he can be a bust because at worst, he's an elite rim protector. That's right. not a bust. Like, you cannot say that that... But if he turns out to be a top three defender in the league, that's not a bust. I don't care what he's doing on the offensive end. I can't, he literally cannot be a bust. So, yeah. yeah, I agree with everything you said. Yeah, and then uh, getting back into the Lakers here, moving back into uh, their restricted free agency. Other guy there is Rui. Um, Rui, again, is a guy that the, the Lakers have been linked to re-signing. They're... All signs are pointing to they're going to get uh, Rui and Austin Reeves back and look to make plays in other areas to retool that roster. But what do you think about about keeping Rui um, on the roster here for the Lakers? I'm I'm fully on board with running everything back with adding a couple pieces because yes, the Lakers got swept in the Western Conference Finals. You can say that, but I can also say. You threw the you threw the team together at the deadline. We had mm-hmm. no training camp together. We didn't have the whole season together, and we started the playoffs right after the All Star break because the Lakers had to make the playoffs. So if, if if I'm being optimistic, I could look at it from a standpoint of let's run it back. We have a whole training camp. We have a preseason. We have the whole season to get the chemistry, get the cohesion, get everything. We're gonna have healthy LeBron, healthy AD. Get to the point where I I believe the Lakers could be a top four is seed in the west to the point where late in the regular season they don't have to play guys all like you don't have to play your guys every single game all these minutes just to make the playoffs just to barely get into the playoffs you can rest guys going into the playoffs and then be healthy and more well rested with a better with more chemistry on the roster so i'm fully on board with running the team back like i said i would love to get at a guy like bruce brown in my dream world i would love to have a, a brooke lopez but i don't think that's really like realistic at this point, but add a couple guys here. I want Bruce Brown, resign Rui, resign Reeves. At this point, if we get Bruce Brown, I'm fine with bringing back D'Lo as well. And then mm. I, I also would love to add like another center on the team. But other than that, I mean, I'm fine with it. I think we can compete. Yeah, I think getting another center is necessary. Um, and we need more this. bodies. Yeah. yeah. I was surprised at the the Mo Bamba wave, but I know that they also said that they're going to keep a close eye on them in free agency yeah. to potentially bring them back on a, a more team friendly deal. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that makes sense there. Like you said, they need more big men bodies. Obviously, getting off of Thomas Bryant at the deadline as well. Um, but yeah, I look if you guys minimally you keep Austin Reeves, you keep Rui, you bring in Bruce Brown, you don't got to do nothing else. Like as a, a win of a free agency period. And you see what this team looks like having a full offseason together. And maybe you make some retooling at the trade deadline. But it's a very, very competitive core that we already saw, you know, are able to get into the Western Conference Finals. At this point, like, you just need to build to stop Denver. Yeah. Um, and if we're taking away Bruce Brown, that hurts them a little bit, brings up a little bit, bring us up a little bit. We already, I already seen reports. Rui said he's going to have a full offseason working with Phil Handy. I need Vanderbilt to just get a corner three. If he gets a <laughs> corner three, he's one of the best role players in the league. Like, bro, anything can happen. And you never know. We Listen, repeating in any professional sport, especially the NBA, is always going to be tough because anything can happen. Injuries can happen. I'm not saying no one's wishing for injuries, but injuries can happen. Just anything in general can happen. So I'm not, oppo- I'm, I'm not going to be opposed to running the team back and just seeing what happens going forward again. Yeah. Um, a couple more restricted free agents I want to wrap this up with. Two guys. Um, first one here is Cam Johnson, 
who the Nets have been vocal about wanting to keep. Um, they, he specifically said, um, the GM Sean Mark said, he's a big priority for us. Um, there's no question there. Um, and you don't want to acquire a guy like him at the trade deadline and let him walk for free. Um, so as restricted free agent, I think they're prepared to match any offer sheets that come in. Um, according to Mark Stein, the Pistons consider Cam Johnson their number one target um, in free agency, which, look, I like it a ton, right? Because they, mm-hmm. they, again, they bring him in. They're already going to move off of Bogdanovich, right? So, like, he slots in very easily there. Um, and that that young core is nice. Like, w- I think maybe this next episode, we're going to have like a good little half hour segment on just going through all the young cores in the NBA. Cause I, I don't, I feels like we've haven't had this many young cores at once, at least not for, not that I can remember in a very long time. Bro, think um, about it. You, the only teams that don't really have a young core is like the Wizards. Like all the team, think about it. If besides the Wizards, who's gonna be the worst team in the NBA? Like all those teams have young guys. Like the Wizards are the only the the only team that is like fully just starting the rebuild. Like we don't have the pieces yet. Right. The Rockets do. The Spurs have their guy. Utah's already a a decent team. Mm-hmm. Like Orlando has the pieces. Right. Charlotte has pieces. If even if Portland trades Dane, right. they have their young they have core. Pieces, like bro, the Thunder, everybody, right, yeah. the Pistons, everybody, like are, is going in a certain direction. The teams, only teams that like are in terrible spots are those like the Bulls. I mm-hmm. think the Raptors. Cause I don't think they're winning anything. Like those middling. Yeah. Like you're not gonna, you're not bad enough. You're not good enough. Those type of teams. Everyone else, yeah. they they can say they have a really good future ahead. Yeah. No. I I completely agree. Like aside from the Wizards, like. Teams are either in that weird middle ground, but there's no, like, teams are either very clear, especially in the West, like, teams are either very clearly looking to contend, or they've got their young core already, like, there's not even really a need to tank, like, I was listening to the low post, and they were saying, like, the West, from top to bottom, like, Everyone has incentive to just like win now, be, like yeah, not good. necessarily become a contender, but it's like w- there's nothing to tank for. Like we got our right. guys, like right. So you could very easily see teams that were in the lottery being in the play, and teams that were in the lottery being in the playoffs. Teams that were in the playoffs, like who knows? They somebody has to be in the lottery. <laughs> Someone just has to be the worst teams in the West, and I do not think it's necessarily going to be the same teams that we saw this year. Somebody's gonna have to slip, but I think all of the teams, at least coming into the year, like it's not gonna be a year where it's like, oh, we're tanking for Victor, we're tanking for Victor. Like I think all of these teams, they got guys, and it's gonna be like, let's go out and let's see what we can do. At least from the the get go, like every team is gonna be looking to compete from the start of the season, especially out west. And I'm excited because all these teams are going to be fun to watch. Like, I'm just happy. Like, even if they're bad, they're going to be fun to watch. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm going to watch a lot of Rockets games. I'm going to watch a lot of a lot of Pistons games. Like, which is something that I haven't really, especially with the Pistons, haven't really said in the last couple of years. So, yeah. I think the regular season is going to be really, really interesting. No, I'm really excited to see, to see K back healthy. If they're able to get a guy like Cam Johnson, like, he slots in with that core perfectly right. He provides great fit, provides defense, spacing on the offensive side, elite shooting as a role player, which is exactly what you would want to pair um, with a guy like Kay Cunningham and Jane Ivey, especially with Ivey's um, ability to get downhill and get to the rim, right? You want to keep those driving lanes open. So that makes a ton of sense. You move off Bogdanovich, potentially you get a, you know, a first back, maybe two first back. You can get a young player back. Like Again, this is a situation where it feels like the Pistons just can't go wrong. Like, you cannot go wrong. Like, even if you blow all your money on a the small overpay to get a guy like Cam Johnson, right? Like, and you maybe have a little bit left over and fill out your roster, and you then move off Bogdanovich, like, that's a win. That's a win. Mm-hmm. You just brought in Asar Thompson, right? Like, this core is nice. Like, you cannot go wrong with, with what they have there, so... Um, I think that that fit makes a makes a ton of sense in, in Detroit. They are able to keep him in Brooklyn because it seems like Brooklyn is 
really heavy to hold on to him and Mikel. They didn't want to trade Mikel for three first round picks, four first round picks. Um, what you so, wouldn't trade Michael Jordan for three? It doesn't matter. He's, like he's Michael Jordan, bro. You wouldn't trade him for nothing. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, even the Nets, like the Nets, are a team that's in a. I wouldn't say they have a young core. They kind of have gotten lumped around in that conversation, but like. Mikel is older. Cam is a little bit older. Like, they're not super, super young. All these guys are entering, like, their prime years. Um, they're just in these new elevated roles, kind of, you know, where they have more more opportunity, more responsibility, um, and are, are really thriving in it. So, mm-hmm. interested to see what the Nets do um, in terms of trying to build out that roster there around, you know, Mikel, but, and, and Nick Claxton, too, because Nick Claxton is going to be a name that, Especially as we get into the season, a lot of these contending teams are going to want. Teams are going to throw some trade offers out there for Nick Claxton. I would not be stunned if the Suns threw an offer for Nick Claxton and got off at Aiton. And I mean, like, if I'm the Nets, I'd probably say no just because, like, what else do they really have to offer? And honestly, if it's some straight up one for one with you know some draft capital that's gonna have to be in like twenty thirty four yeah right? fifty yeah. <laughs> like it, bro even just straight up give me Claxton over Aiden right now any day of the week I, so, I take Claxton bro I'm not you know how I feel about DeAndre Aiden. right you, so, you so I'm, go ahead go ahead I'm about to say unless they can work it where it's like a three team deal where like Aiden ends up there Claxton ends up here they get draft assets from another team and like they kind of have to maneuver it around but like. Nick Claxton would be like, that would be like, wow, chef's kiss if he could get in Phoenix. Like, he fills so many gaps on that roster immediately, like, just 100%. off of the, the rim protection and the rebound screen setting. That is all you need out of your center <laughs> in right. Phoenix. And I think teams have realized, like, there's really been a shift in terms of what centers teams really want. Like there was a point in time where you saw a lot of guys come in, that whole unicorn thing with guys like Porzingis. Teams are going after these flashy upside bigs who a lot of them just, they did not pan out. And the wave is kind of shifted back to, what if I just got a screen setting, rim running, rebounding rim protector to play my five? Mm-hmm. I don't need him to do anything else. Guys like Mitchell Robinson, guys like Nick Claxton, like... Those are the type of teams that, those are the type of the guys that teams, especially contending teams, are really, really going to want, um, especially like any of the teams in like win now mode. So uh, Nick Claxton, I think, is going to be a hot commodity. And I think the Nets, if I were them, I would be in a spot where I would seriously look at like not rebuilding, but like almost like a soft rebuild. Like, you take the assets that you have now. I don't see a great way forward for you to turn this into like a contender. But you move some pieces around to consolidate some, to get some more assets. And then you consolidate those assets to maybe pair a superstar with Mikel Bridges. Then you build out that roster. I think that may be the best way forward from Brooklyn instead of like, we got our guys, we're going to hold on to our guys. Because then I think you creep into that conversation we just had about you know teams like right chicago and toronto where it's like cool y'all aren't a bad team like y'all are like a seven seed y'all are never gonna get out of the second round Mm -hmm. so i definitely see what you're saying i I think yeah i agree they're in they're just in that point where they need they have all the pieces to get another superstar like we've talked about they've had (laughs) their team seems like they were full of just the best role players in the league and then Mikel Bridges, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, like, even, honestly, even this offseason, who's to say Damian Lillard doesn't come to Brooklyn? Like, he's talked about he doesn't want to go to a team that's stacked. He just wants a chance. You will have a chance in the East with Mikel Bridges, with Nick Claxton, with Cam Johnson. Well, I don't know who's going to be traded, but regardless, Mikel Bridges is not leaving. So that's an, that's an interesting team. I'm not going to pick them to come out of the East. I don't think they will come out of the East. But what we've heard from Damian Lillard is he just wants a chance. You're going to have a chance with that team. So they're, I think they're just in a place where they just need plug in one superstar and they're making some noise in the East. Yeah. So 
I think that they're in a good spot. You know, if they bring back Cam Johnson again, doesn't mean that he's there long term. Still be moved potentially in a deal um, to pair someone with Mikel. So um, I think ultimately they'll probably end up bringing him back. But Detroit, I think, is really going to give him a run for their money just with the, the cap space that they do have. Like they just can offer more mm-hmm. um, than, than the Nets can. So and it's going to be tough for them to to match. Um, up to a certain point, if the the Pistons are willing to go that hard for for a guy who's supposedly number one on their board, according to Mark Stein. Um, last guy I really kind of want to touch on here, I guess last two, uh, Miles Bridges and Grant Williams. Uh, Miles Bridges is another guy that has been you know linked to a couple of teams around the league. Um, the the Pistons, I think, as well as a p- potential landing spot there. Um, the Hornets, I think, would, would really like to re-sign him. People are speculating that the Cavs may be linked to him as well. Um, you know, they had the him and Darius Garland had the picture come out. Um, obviously, off the court stuff aside, like the reality is, like he's going to be playing in the mm-hmm. NBA this mm-hmm. year. Like we can't control any of that. Like nobody's going to condone what he did off the court. But strictly talking from a on the court perspective. Um, for the same reasons why I would like Bruce Brown in Cleveland, obviously you're paying more, but that gives you this solidified person at your three spot. Um, if you're able to bring Miles Bridges in, um, if they, they keep him there in, um, in Charlotte, we saw what he was able to do when he was on the court with LaMelo. He really taken that leap, um, you know, with that, with them there. So I think that would be a good fit either way. Or again, even in a team like Detroit, like he fits the timeline, fits the spacing, um, so e- either of those three teams, I think, make a ton of sense to me. Yeah, one hundred percent. I like the Cavs fit a lot. I yeah. like the Cavs fit, and I, that's that's why they're linked to them. Or they seem that seemed like the the team that can give them the most, other than the Hornets. So now I definitely like the Cavs fit. Like you said, it just he just slides into that three spot so easily, and that's just such a position of need for them. That like one of these fours, they got to go out and try to get one of these guys. So I think he'll fit in there perfectly. Yeah, and the uh, the last guy I have up here is, is Grant Williams, um, who was huge in their, their finals run the year before. Kind of had really on and off minutes um, throughout the playoffs this past year under Joe Mazzulla. Um We all know the game that he had in Milwaukee and just lit them up from three. Um, I think he's a very, very good, um, kind of undersized big um, obviously can can play above his height. Um, very great floor spacer, can, can be in the corner. Um, it's kind of been speculating that he's looking for a contract in similar type of range as Keldon Johnson, which is a little under $20 million a year, um, which I think could fit, right? Like 15 to 18 mil for Grant Williams, I think makes sense. Um, so I believe he turned down a deal of almost – 50 million, um, kind of an extension with the Celtics earlier. Um, he's going to look to get paid. Um, again, he's a restricted free agent, so the Celtics can match any offers there. Um, but I think Grant Williams can be a very, very solid piece, either on a, a young developing team or a you know a team looking to compete. He's got the the skill set, the spacing, the defense. Like three D guys are always going to be coveted across the league. So, 100. percent I like to feel with the Mavericks if he was to go there. Look. If the Mavericks could get a guy like Grant Williams to come in, floor space, like we said, defense, give you some grit. That team needs some grit. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually like that fit better than Boston. Like, I just think he's not going to get utilized as much as Boston as he would in, in Dallas. Like, yeah. I like that fit a lot. And the, the gravity between um, Luka and Kyrie is like, them threes are going to be real open, <laughs> real wow. open in a corner. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I like that a ton. 100%. I even like Milwaukee if they end up losing like a, like a Brooke Lopez and they really got to do this small ball stuff. Mm-hmm. I can see him in Milwaukee. He can space the floor but still give you defense, still give you a little bit of, you know, grit and everything like that. So I, mm-hmm. I like that fit if they lose a Brooke Lopez. I didn't even think about Milwaukee. That's a real good one. That is a real good one because, again, that allows you to play – Giannis at the five, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or even potentially you have a, you have Bobby Portis come in and play the five, and he's the the bigger-ish body, right, that right. plays on the big. You still have Giannis being 
one of, if not the best, help defenders in the NBA. Um, you still have Drew Holiday out there on the perimeter. And then it's like you have Grant Williams to come off of your bench. And if needed in the playoffs, like you can easily run a lineup where he starts. Um, mm-hmm. If you need the body, you need the switchability, like – I might like that fit better than Dallas. I know I just said I really like the Dallas fit, but Milwaukee to me makes a ton of sense. Yeah, I was just looking because I I see I just think he would be best utilized on a team that is a contender with other superstars around him. Like he, yes, he could definitely go to a young team, but I just think just his skill set would be best utilized as a guy who can play off of other guys, basically. So I just I, I think that Milwaukee fit. I like it a lot. Like I said, especially if they end up losing Brook Lopez and they go into this more of a small ballish type of lineup, I think he could definitely help them out. Yeah, and um, I'm keeping Twitter open just for any crazy, crazy news. A um, couple more rumors have come out since you recorded. Um, I just want to go through these before we, we wrap up the episode. First one here, that we didn't spend a lot of time talking about, but... Um, Gabe Vincent, Vincent, also an unrestricted free agent. Supposedly, the Heat are only offering him, offering him $8 million a year. Um, I think he could get more, um, and teams are going to offer him more. Like It's always going to be tough when you're a contending team to keep a great role player because there will be a team that comes in and just probably overpays him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I think it's going to be tough for them to keep Gabe Vincent and Max Struess, to be honest with you. Um, that's going to be hard for them to do. Um, another one here that I see, um, this one is coming from, uh, Lakers daily Lakers could target Kevin love in free agency. Hey man, I'll take it. We know what him and LeBron did already once before. Every time K love been in the playoffs, he's been to the finals, man. So let's keep that That streak alive. That is such a crazy stat. That is a crazy stat. Um, and the biggest one here is, this is from Ian Begley, um, who works uh, covering the Knicks and the Nets, said that several teams are currently monitoring Giannis's situation in Milwaukee. And the quote here is that it's worth noting here that several teams are keeping an eye on the situation in Milwaukee concerning the future of Giannis Antetokounmpo, as we previously noted. He's eligible for an extension with Milwaukee this summer. Financially, it makes sense for Ana DeCumpo to wait on signing an extension or new contract. And so, as I mean, like, you could probably say that teams are keeping an eye on every single star player in the league. So, I mean, that right. feels like more smoke. But, again, with Chris Middleton's future up in the air, Brooke Lopez's future up in the air, kind of coinciding at a time where, you know, he's not locked down for a couple of years, like, Milwaukee, there's some pressure. And coming off of <laughs> a first-round exit, uh, Milwaukee, there's some pressure there to get a good roster back in place like immediately if you want to keep Giannis, Giannis happy there. Hey, man. Giannis to the Rockets. Who knows? <laughs> you, don't, you, don't know. you don't know. You never know. I think it's, it's – man, it's funny when these superstars – I like he, obviously it hasn't happened yet, but when these superstars get on the market, it's funny watching these teams scramble to try to throw something together to get these guys. So it does it does really ever happen, but when it does, it is so entertaining to see. Also, I don't know if you saw this morning. ESPN is laying off like twenty plus different on air talent. Bro, they they fired Max Kellerman, Keyshawn Johnson, Jalen yeah. Rose, Jeff Whatever. Van Gundy is Jeff, gone. Yeah. Like that he's Gundy? that was their their like lineup their finals commentary team for the last like decade is Jeff Mike Breen and Mark Jackson. Why are they doing this? I guess budget cuts. Your ESPN <laughs> like bro, bro I, what? you know rich people don't want to get off the bread, bro. <laughs> you know they don't want to get off the bread. You, you know what this means though. That means they're going to run Stephen A. Smith to the ground. You are on every segment, every every episode. You doing get up, first take, sports every. center. <laughs> Bro, they're going to run him to the ground, man. What? Um, yeah, they're going to go with Jalen Rose, too. Jay Williams, gone, too. Like, it's And it's coming out in, like, waves. Like, they didn't – they, like – some of the people, like the talent, is announcing that they let go. Like they're calling each person individually to let them know. Um, 
That's that hard. is that is tough. Van Gundy is like that is a shock. That was a while, um, yeah. Because they've had that group together for such a long time. Um, it almost makes me feel like, honestly, you know who's probably about to fill that seat? Who? J.J. Reddick. And, and if he don't go fill the head coaching seat. but <laughs> uh, but it's, it, I mean, it makes sense. It definitely he, makes sense. They've already tapped him. He was the you know on the, the draft this past year. He's been doing color commentary with um, you know, on ESPN for this past season. Um, it would make a lot of sense to then tap a guy like him or... I, look, I would like Doris Burke too. I think Doris Burke is a great commentator. Um, so, yeah, if be, so be, Twitter weirdos can stop being weird and like, like, bro, don't, never mind. I ain't even gonna get into that. Yeah, <laughs> I ain't even gonna get into that. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, she would be, she would be good doing that, doing the, um, yeah. the commentary. But it's yeah, just, it would be a little bit tough though, because I'm so the finals. That's just what I'm used to, bro. It's the Mark they Jackson. have great chemistry. Bro, it literally, is like nice, Mike bro. Breen is talking about the game. Jeff Van Gundy is telling us some wild story about the 80s. Mark Literally. Jackson is talking about something completely unrelated. <laughs> Mike Breen is like, there's another bucket. Like, he's the only person <laughs> trying to keep it on track. But, like, right. they just have really good chemistry. So it's weird for them to, to break that up. Hang, man. We're getting old. That's what it is. We're getting old, man. Stuff is changing. I don't like it, man. I don't like it. Like, what does this open the door to? Like, Cause like what are like are they gonna fill it with more like big name talent from across the space? Are they gonna try to get like a guy from TNT or something? Or if I'm ESPN and you're concerned about younger demographic not tuning in and watching broadcasts or streaming, Bro, you might start tapping a content creator or two to come and get himself a show. You, you might know? have to. And you're probably going to pay him less. Not probably. You are going to pay no, him No, you're less. definitely going to pay them less. I would say, not probably. You're going to pay him less because, bro, if they asked us to go on ESPN for free, we'd do it I, right now. I would pay. I would <laughs> right. give you money if you let me get on ESPN because yeah. the exposure you're going to get is not like when, when Kenny went on first take, he was like, they did not pay him to go on for a second. He was like, I typically don't do things for free. He's like, this is like one of those like two or three percent of times where I would because it's like there's people that I've never talked to, like big name people in the sports space who didn't know who I was, who DM me after that. I was like, oh, shoot, I saw you on first take, bro. What's up? Like, cool. Like that level of exposure, like you can't even put a price tag on that. Like yeah. he's going to he's going to get the, the money back from that <laughs> and more 10 times. Right. right. Like, <laughs> but. Yeah, bro, if I'm ESPN, I would look to tap some of the bigger um, the bigger names in the content creation space. And you could do, like, simulcast shows, like what they're doing with the Pat McAfee show, where they're bringing that on ESPN but still letting them broadcast it on YouTube. Like, mm -hmm. bro, you could do the same type of deal. You have them simulcast it on air, simulcast it on ESPN YouTube. They could still post it on their own YouTube channel, like... Hey, look, ESPN, you need a strategy session? Like, hit me up. I, I, right. <laughs> I got the keys. <laughs> I need FS1 to do some budget cuts because them guys suck. A lot yeah. of them, a lot of those analysts, like, I like a few. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I, I don't like, like none of them. <laughs> I, like Chris, I like Chris Roussard. I think the First Things First show is a really good show. I like the show. But, like, The Herd, that Carlton guy, whatever his name is, bro, a lot of them guys don't know what they're talking about. Undisputed. Them guys, all them guys need to go. But, hey, man, it is what it is. Man, I got a suspicion that like, we're about to wrap this episode and somebody's about to get traded. Bro, like, the <laughs> minute you hit stop recording, James Harden has been traded to the Clippers. For I, a bag, for right, a bag know, of chips. We're going to have to do some emergency pot or something. Like, right. Add so something I'm looking, back on. Yeah. I'm looking at it and somebody just tweeted, it's like, you know, again, the, the Pacers traded Chris Dorte to the Kings for draft compensation and just no other follow-up on what the draft compensation is. It's like, is there a third team here? Are we, like, are we mm -hmm. trying to figure something out? Like, right. what's going on with that? Another another rumor just came out. The Pacers are emerging as a top landing spot for Obi Toppin. I like that fit a ton. Ooh, okay. Like, good. Let him get some minutes, some run somewhere where he can actually hoop. So, Look, look, like you said, we're going we're gonna to wrap this episode up. But if somebody gets traded, 
Just know it's gonna be a, a quick follow up. <laughs> quick okay. follow up. Hey, I'm free today. If you want to start it right back up, I'm <laughs> fine, bro. I'm fine with that. That is crazy, but. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Off the Glass podcast. Again, this has been our free agency preview show. Free agency officially opens tonight, 6 p.m. Eastern. Uh, most of, a lot of deals are probably already done, but you know they can't get caught with those tampering violations. So mm-hmm. at, at 6 o'clock Eastern on the dot, out of nowhere, you're going to see like 10 different contracts have already been signed. So Facts. Um, it's going to be a, a lot of shakeup here around the league, so... Um, you know, we gave our thoughts on, on you know, what's here to play out of this today and then the next few weeks with free agency and some of these trades. But this offseason is just getting started, just getting started. So um, it's exciting. It's exciting. But if you are on YouTube and you made it to the end of the episode, first of all, we really appreciate you. Go ahead and leave a like and comment on the video. Um, go ahead and, and follow those socials that you see at the bottom at Off the Glass Pod on Instagram and at Off the Glass Podcast on TikTok. If you're listening on audio uh, platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, go ahead and drop a five star review. Um, we appreciate the support as always. I'm Billy, that's Dame, and we out. Peace. Yes, sir.